Welcome back to another experiment. In this video, we're gonna be seeing how much weight a plant gains by the means of photosynthesis, so basically measuring the amount of carbon that it pulls in from the atmosphere from carbon dioxide and converts it into solid form. And to do that, we're gonna be taking the powder nutrients, which I've already done here, adding it to RODI water, so there's nothing in the water whatsoever, and I've actually added 5.2 grams of the powder for this. And at the end of this, we're gonna take that lettuce and the roots, dehydrate them completely, and we're gonna weigh it and then subtract the amount of nutrients that actually absorbed. And we're also gonna be having to let the lettuce basically absorb everything in that bucket and then in, until it dries and then it's probably gonna to start to wilt. And that's okay because we're going to be weighing it when it's dry anyways. This video is actually also part two of the liquid nutrients versus the powder nutrients. So if you haven't seen part one and the see basically why we're doing this video, go ahead and click the link up here or at the end of the video to watch that one to get more details on that. Both of these containers here, when I added the nutrients, are exactly 715 parts per million measured with my TDS meter. And for this experiment, we're actually using this new light. This is from Yearold, and you can see it right here. It's a white LED grow light with a mixture of different things. We're going to talk more about that in a minute, but before we do that, I just wanted to kind of note here because some people are trying to do grow experiments where they do side by side things and they're using a light or if they're under a single light and they don't have a very good power meter. This Apogee MQ500 power meter is calibrated for LED lights and for uh, red lights and all that stuff. So even if I was to take this container and move it over just an inch, that significantly changes the amount of par going to the tops of this versus this one. So through this whole experiment, I'm actually using that par meter as it's growing to make sure the par levels are identical for both. I usually check that every other day, just like most of my other experiments. I don't really always talk about that either. So we're going to go ahead and go to the next segment of this video. We're going to talk about this light here. Some of you might remember a video I posted a while ago on a year-old LED grow light, which is the light I'm currently using for this grow test. And I had to take that video down because that light in particular needed to be revised. And in this video, we're actually using the revised version. But let's take a look at the video I posted a while ago to see what the differences are. Some people like to start their day with a cup of coffee or tea, while others like nicotine or Red Bull enemas. Me, I like to start my day with a little bit of sunshine. What? What does that have to do with a grow light? I mean, whoa, 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 wait, wait. <sighs> I am just getting sick and tired of my editor posting up that interrupting logo up on the screen for the channel name with that explosion and glass breaking sound. It's just getting really annoying. I just want to get on with the video without interruption and be done with it. So I'm going to have to have a chat with my editor about that. So the year-old LED grow light, the, the first model that they made, had a few problems with it. So they stopped uh, producing, stopped selling it, and they made a new model, uh, which is the one I'm using for this video. But the previous model had a few things I wanted to mention that they revised and improved on. Uh, first would be the driver. This is still the same uh, well-known, uh, really efficient, mean-well driver, uh, but I think the model is a little bit different, and I think the, um, the power it's putting out is a little bit less. And what that is translating to is less heat, so it's better regulated. So the previous model, when I was testing it, when it was at full blast, um, with the brightness all the way up, it basically was getting up to like 150 degrees Fahrenheit on that little passive heat sink. And that's pretty hot for a passive heat sink light. And that's, it's tolerable for the diodes they can handle for you know some time, but that's really gonna reduce the life of them. So the new model, the one I'm using for this video, they reduced, the output of it, and it's actually putting out a temperature uh, after having it on for several hours, about 115 degrees top. So uh, that's more normalized, and that's about where you'd want it to be so you don't overdrive your diodes and burn your diodes out too soon. So if you want the full life of that 50,000 hours of the, what they're rated at, you really got to drive them uh, less hard. And I, I believe this light is actually made to be a little bit more efficient. Whoa, 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 hold up. Future Ryan here. When I was making this part of this video, I did not have a chance to test this light, and I did not realize it was going to be the most efficient light I've ever tested. And you are going to see the specs at the very end of this video, so watch to the end. But I knew it was going to be efficient because the wattage draw from the wall was relatively low compared to a lot of lights that I've tested, and I was still getting quite a bit of par 
at uh, further distances from the light. So I was very surprised by that. So stay tuned to the end to see the rest. Also, the original model had um, a little kind of pigtail wire out on the driver, the, uh, the meanwhile driver, and that was for installing your own dimmer. And I personally did not like that idea. I didn't like the idea of having a light that's dimmable, but you have to basically solder on your own dimmer. Uh, it really should come as a complete package. And they have since kind of taken that dimmer away completely, so it doesn't really have a dimming option on it, uh, but it does have a, a dial. If you pull the driver off on the underside of it, you'll see a little, uh, a little rubber, um, it's a rubber plug plugging up a hole. And if you pull that out, you'll see a little, uh, if you put a screwdriver in there, it's actually going to be able to change the, the voltage of it, the voltage regulation, and you can dim a light down that way if you really wanted to. Um, from, what I, from what I tested so far with its max output, uh, it doesn't seem to be too bad. It's not using too much wattage, so I don't see any real reason to dim it down too much anyways. Uh, I don't notice any flicker on the light, and it's also putting out uh, quite a bit of par. Uh, it's got really good intensity uh, at uh, about 18 inches or so from the light still for a light that small and with that low wattage. So I think it actually is pretty efficient. For what they say, this particular light is supposed to have 2.5 micromoles per joule. But like I said, I will be testing that to verify that at the end of the video, so stay tuned for that. And that kind of brings me to the last thing about the light, is that the original light had a lens cover on it, and I do not like lenses on grow lights. And the reason is, is because you don't get very good uniform light. You get a lot of intensity in a small area, and then it fades quickly outside of that particular zone that's focused. I like diodes that are not covered, and they're evenly diffused light. The plants seem to like it better because you have much better even coverage. Uh, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the more efficient lights you're seeing these days are actually strip lights, uh, strips of LEDs that are covering a bigger area, and you get a lot better of efficiency that way. And as far as efficiency goes, there were some things about the diodes people were saying, and I'm not sure how true that is. I'm not going to get into that, but I'm going to tell you that the diodes they're using for this light are the Samsung LM301B. Uh, Those are the white and the cool white diodes, so I believe it's it's 3000K and 5000K whites, and then it also has the red diodes on there as well, and those are not Samsung, those are Gorin. I'm actually not familiar with Gorin, but that's what brand they are. Uh, 35, 35, 35Rs is what they're called, so for the red ones. Um, and those are 660 nanometer deep reds. That's basically just for a little better flowering. Um, so that's pretty much it as far as talking about the light. Uh, so far, it's been in service for a bit. I'm happy with it. I'm actually using the old version for something else, and I'm happy with that one too. I actually just removed the lens cover on it. Um, so that's it. Let's get back to the grow test, and it's going to be towards the end of the grow test so I can finish up this video and we can uh, see the results. Okay, you can see here we're getting close to the end of the experiment, and the lettuce head here on the left has actually almost completely wilted. And that's because it sucked up all of the solution that was in this container. The lettuce head on the right, however, is still growing pretty well. It's looking pretty good, and there's still a little bit of solution left in there. Uh, so just to clarify, both of these containers started out with the exact same amount of solution. Uh, this one here is just sucking up less water. And if you watch part one of the liquid nutrients versus the powder nutrients, because the powder nutrients are in this one, uh, you saw this was the opposite effect. Not so much as far as the wilting goes, but the way the plants actually have been growing. And this is gonna be kind of hard to show here, but basically in part one uh, were the liquid versus the powder nutrients, the plant in the liquid nutrients was more like this one where it had shorter, uh, less elongated leaves and more jagged edges. Uh, and the powder nutrients container in part one had uh, more elongated rounded leaves. And like I said in that video, uh, they started out that way. Uh, when I was selecting the sprouts, that's kind of how the first true leaves looked. So it was a genetic thing and not so much a nutrients thing. This is the exact opposite of the first video here. All right, so it's been one week since the last segment of this video. You can see here the plant in the container with the powder nutrients has finally started wilting. And over here, this was the plant from the container in the liquid nutrients. And I started, I'm starting to dry these out basically on a piece of wax paper. Uh, more about that in a second. But um, I wanted to make this segment real quick so you can see that the lettuce here looks kind of weird. And for those of you who don't know, lettuce is a flowering plant. Um, we just eat it before it flowers. Um, but you can see here it's elongating up like this. This actually has nothing to do with the light or its uh, uh, suppression of vertical growth. What's actually happening here or what was happening with the lettuce is it was bolting 
that's right before it flowers. So both of these plants, um, they started out nice and compact. The seedlings were very compact. There was no reaching at all. So that kind of talks about how the abilities of this year old light here uh, does a very good job of suppressing vertical growth. But also on the other hand, uh, because of the amount of red light this it has, it has a, a quite a few red diodes in there, uh, that actually triggers flowering. So the lettuce was actually bolting and um, I believe it had a lot to do with that because this is the first time I've actually seen lettuce bolt this way. Out of all the lights I've been using and how the, the, the amount of time that I've basically been growing lettuce, I've never seen it do this in particular. Now the other one didn't really do that, the one that was in the liquid nutrients, it was kind of starting to, but this had more time, so that's why. So basically like a week more of growing. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that. So now what we're gonna do is get to uh, pull these off, we're gonna dry these out, we're gonna dehydrate them in uh, an oven for a little while, and we're gonna to get to that segment. So I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna do that. Okay, so I've been drying out this plant material for about a week or two now, just air drying it. So now what I'm gonna do is take these, keep them separated, and I'm gonna put them in this toaster oven on the dehydrate setting, and it's gonna go in there for a couple hours, and then we're gonna come back and we're going to weigh everything. Okay, so we are now at my most favorite part of any experiment and what you've all been waiting for, and that's the results. So I have these trays here sitting in front of me. Uh, these have been sitting in the toaster oven on the dehydrate setting for about 24 hours, and now they're nice, nice and crispy. So uh, there's practically no moisture left in them whatsoever to obscure the results at all. Uh, so I have a tray here. This one here is from the plant that was grown in with the liquid nutrients. Uh, and then this here is from the one that was in the dry, the powder nutrients, uh, along with the roots for that one as well. So for those of you who have followed along from the previous video from part one of the liquid versus the powder nutrients, we're going to start with that. So I got my gram scale sitting over here. Uh, this is a pretty sensitive gram scale. If I just was to blow lightly on it, you can see the number change. So it basically will show you a down to the tenth of a gram. Uh, so I got this bowl here. And then we will tear the weight of the bowl. There we go. Now we're zeroed out. So we're going to go ahead and take the uh, liquid nutrients plant. And we're going to take all of the uh, material here and put it in the bowl. And see what weight we get. All right. So I have the bowl filled up. And that is 11.8 grams of dry plant matter. So now we're going to go ahead and do the one, the plant that was growing in the powder nutrients. Okay, so the plant that was grown in the powder nutrients is exactly 17 grams. So right off the bat, you can clearly see that the plant that was grown in the powder nutrients has produced significantly more plant matter. And 5.2 grams difference is, is quite a bit uh, in dry weight. So now we're gonna go ahead and add the roots into there and see how much the roots weigh so we can figure out how much carbon from the air the plant actually absorbed. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the roots here. We're gonna dump them in the bowl and see how much the roots weigh all together. Doesn't feel like a lot, but we'll see how much that comes out to. So that's uh, 4.1 grams in the roots. So uh, the bucket that had the powder nutrients in it after everything dried out, there was a little bit of crystallization in the container and I basically dissolved all that uh, with some alcohol, let the alcohol evaporate, and then I weighed what was left. And it was about 0.1 grams of nutrients left uh, residual in the container. So I have to subtract 0.1 grams. So we're going to say that that's 4 grams right there in, in that container, 4 grams of roots. Uh, we'll just add that on to the 17, and that gives us 21 grams of plant matter. So what we do now is take the total weight of the plant, which is 21 grams, and we subtract the original amount of nutrients that we've put in there, which was 5.2 grams, and we get a total of 15.8 grams. So this plant here has absorbed and is made up of 15.8 grams of carbon, or carbon dioxide converted into a solid form. So I think that's pretty interesting. And I hope that's pretty satisfying for everyone else out there who's watching. And I think that's it for this video. There's going to be more to come, so stay tuned, and thanks for watching.